uh, thing, uh, what Shalini was talking about, uh, women in cybersecurity expanding the workforce. That is just like so important right now. So I was very happy to hear that. Perfect. Well done. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad it's uh, it's all tying together. Um, uh, Kenji, uh, how, how how have you been? How's how are you enjoying the day? Oh, it's been going great. And yeah, I'm glad that I was able to jump on this and see a lot of the uh, previous uh, webinars as well. But it, it's obviously gone in the, in the right path where we see that there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of enlightenment about having the, the team come together and, and his stand in his organization is, you know, you got to bring the village together in order to make this all work and be secure. So that's good to yeah. see some moving on and, and getting through everybody. Well, perhaps Corona has given us the opportunity to take this uh, topic to the next level. Um, and uh, I, 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 maybe maybe we could start if, if, if Stan explains a bit about secure the village. Uh, you you explain a bit about uh, Overwatch um, IT, and then um, you have the floor to tell us about the MSP standard of tomorrow. That's great. Well, again, thank you so much, Felon, for the opportunity to talk about um, what is, and, and, and we'll get into the substance in a minute. But to just the opportunity for win, 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 win situations abound. And in part, Secure the Village is all about that. It's the idea is it, it takes the village to secure the village. It's just, we got to get everybody involved. And from our perspective, that's from the boardroom all the way to the living room. I mean, just like everybody's got a role to play if we're to secure the global village. And um, I was thinking about this the other day, when you look at the key challenges we face really is a civilization in, in, in some ways. I don't want to make this more than it is, uh, but we, we've got things like climate change and, you know, and, and, and women in cybersecurity helping uh, women grow uh, and, and minorities into the uh, workforce better and, and doing all those kinds of things. But right behind that is cybersecurity, because if we don't protect our systems, then we're wide open to, uh, to every, everything is at risk, our, our economy, our freedoms ultimately. So uh, Secure the Village is all about how do we connect the dots? How do we build the win, 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 win strategies so that we're better able to work together and in that process, we're better able to secure the village. Uh, our language, we turn people and organizations into cyber guardians that way. And so that's, that's what we're about. Uh, Kenji, you want to jump in and introduce yourself as well and say a few words? And... Yep. Thank you, Stan. So yeah, I'm, I'm Kenji Martinez. I work, I'm the founder and CEO over at Oversight IT Consulting. Um, website for that is www.oversightit.com. I actually do IT management and consulting in a different manner. So what I do is I mainly look at the third parties, the vendors, and pretty much anything that touches the network. Um, so a lot of people decide, well, I need to outsource and have somebody manage our services and manage our security. And the main reason why is because they don't understand how to manage it themselves or they're not technologically savvy. So the biggest thing is I come on as an advocate and I make sure that we go through, we do audits with the vendors and uh, make sure that things are all in alignment we also go through and do reviews with compliance and the cybersecurity stance and frameworks. So, you know, same thing as in order to win, you've got to bring everybody together and it starts from the internal and you have to be a partnership between your organization and your vendors. And I'm kind of that glue, that mediator that sits between to make sure we're all, we're all working in the same direction. At the end of the day. Yeah. And, 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 and that, that's so vital. I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Now we'll get started formally, if, if you will. Um, so, but what, what, what Kenji's talking about is, is, is so vital. I've seen this over what is now more than a 40 year career in uh, security engineering and IT security management and, and broadly, more broadly security management. The opportunities just as we get people working together, talking together, collaborating together, good stuff happens, magic happens in essence. And that, that's the substance of what we're gonna be talking about because we see improved management of the client vendor interface, just a win-win-win strategy. And by win-win-win, what we mean is, first of all, the client wins, second, the vendor wins, and third, the client's clients and customers win. And with that, all of society wins because we're doing this stuff better. Uh, and, 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 and as I say, that, that's what so much of, of this is, is about. Uh, next slide is, uh, you know, here's who we are. You got our phone numbers and our contact information and all. In addition to being the uh, founder president of Secure the Village, I'm also a director of information security for a uh, 
CPA firm, uh, Miller Kaplan. We're in North Hollywood, uh, California. Um, I recently sold my company, Citadel Information Group, to them and uh, have stayed on as, as a director of information security for them. Uh, so you'll hear me talk about some of the things we have found in the, in the uh, information security management world, as well as some of the things you found, we have found, uh, we, we find in, in the Secure the Village world. But enough of that, let's just jump in. If you look at the world, uh, slice it up into opportunities and challenges, you see challenges on, on opportunities, both on the MSP side and on the client side. And Kenji, why don't you kick this slide off and begin yeah. talking about these, yeah. Yeah, and, and as a uh, person that came from a, an MSP formerly, you know, these are things that all arise and I started to, to really uh, view and see as issues going forward as, you know, we become into this more cyber attack world. Um, there's a lot more expectation from clients thinking that because you do their IT, you're doing their security. And there's this whole mindset of, you know, what's legally your responsibility versus what's kind of expected or assumed. Um, there's also the issues where, I mean, IT in itself, there's no real regulators of IT vendors and MSPs and how they're supposed to support and manage their clients. And even besides that, you still have another issue of how you're going to secure your client's credentials and infrastructure as well. Um, so there's this whole kind of race that's going on of I got to invest and make myself more secure and protect my clients. But yet I'm also fighting against kind of the mom and pops that are out there that underbid and kind of gouge out. Um, you know, a lot of the, the relationship with your client, because it's like, well, I can get the, the same service for half the cost. And it's like, if, if you're looking for help desk, maybe, but when we look at the overall security and how we're, we're functioning as an organization, you can't compare the two. So, you know, we talk about creating a standard and bring, bring it into a, a regulation. You know, there's things that can help to improve and, and strengthen you as an MSP. And a big part of that too is like, you know, being a, a part of a NIST compliant and now going to be CMMC compliant uh, MSP that I was formerly at, you get to go up on this different platform and level with the defense industry base that we want to bring to the commercial world of saying, hey, we follow security frameworks and we invest in the proper tools, the integrations, the automation that put everything together to make sure that we're securing ourselves to secure you. And that's why there's a difference in the margins. And that's why there's a difference in the quality of the service. And when you start building those bonds, it makes it a lot easier to retain your clients it also gives you those margins available so we can start having these discussions of you know once a month or quarterly let's sit down at a table and make sure that we're working forward to meet compliances or meet, by making sure that we're, we're raising up our security standards yeah um, and then stan do you want to go ahead and move on to the, the client side well I, I just want to add to this i nice 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 layout characterization of, of what we're what's happening but and i just you want to use an example uh, i gave a talk yesterday uh it was sponsored by one of the banks here in los angeles and uh one of the people reached out to me after the talk a director of it for a company there are a couple of hundred people uh he's the it department so already you know that it's not just him alone he's got with which he has to work and so he emailed me he said uh, so what should i expect what should i require in the way of security how do i find out in security what my vendors what my it partners are actually doing how do i navigate that space and when you think about the whole space of you know the client has these challenges um client has the opportunity to take advantage of improved cybersecurity, uh, improved uh, coordination even with, with, with IT, with the MSP, it helps, we, we've seen over the years, just uh, user satisfaction goes way up when there's real good partnership between IT and, 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 its, and its customer, uh, with strict technology being used more strategically, uh, and, and ultimately you, you, you're even required this goes to part of what Kenji said on the, you know, what, what are the standards here? Whatever requirements a company has, it is legally bound, if, particularly if they live in the state of California, to make sure that it's partners with which it shares information, and that absolutely includes its IT partners, that they too play by those 
by those 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 rules and regulations, if if, if you will, uh, and and then that takes us to one of the real challenges we face. This was uh, Major General Brett Williams on this week with George Stephanopoulos back in December six years ago. Now it's like oh my God, that long ago when Sony was breached. And Stephanopoulos has uh, Williams on his show. And at the end of the, 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 the panel discussion, if, if you watch this week with George Stephanopoulos, you know what I'm talking about. Stephanopoulos says to Williams, so if a company comes to you and says, what do we do? How do we get our arms around cybersecurity? Williams says, and I think this is the best like 10 second quote of security that I've ever heard. The number one thing at the board level and CEO level is to take cybersecurity as seriously as you take business operations and financial operations. That's fine. And then Williams goes on to say, it's not good enough to go to your CIO and say, are we good to go? You've gotta be able to ask questions and understand the answers. And the challenge we see, the challenge Kenji sees regularly is that on the client side, there is commonly no one there who's able to ask the questions and understand the answers. I mean, Kenji, tell me your experience, but that's my experience pretty much universally. Yeah, and th that's the interesting side of it too. Is, I mean, I I've been on the MSP side, like I was saying, and sometimes I'll go in these meetings and they say, okay, do you guys do X, Y, and Z? Yes, we do, and this is how we do it. And you kind of start drawing things out and you can see it just completely glazes over right over them. And it gets a little yeah. dangerous too because you start wondering like, well, do they really understand the fundamentals of why this is important or, or the arrangements of these tools and processes? Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah on, on my end too, I'm going now as my own, my own company to go and, and provide oversight. And they go, oh yeah, our vendor said that we're doing backups. All right, cool. Let's start getting into the technical. Let's find out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. Then we'll find out, hey, you know what, the backups have been done. They were actually completed four hours ago. They're, they're doing images instead of file level. When's the last time you guys did a test restore? And the vendor goes, uh, oh, they never asked for that. So it's like, oh, so we've been backing up an infrastructure for over a year, and we don't know that we're backing up the right files. We don't know if there's any kind of corruption in those files. You know, and there's a lot of different things. Or they're paying for three separate internet uh, vendors, and they're all plugged into the firewall, and all, or their SD-WAN, and we find out no one configured it. They're just sitting there and they're sitting idle. Power goes out, internet goes out, whatever it is, and all these failovers and redundancies they're investing in are dead in the water. And it's kind of like that emergency call of, we don't know what's going on, everything turned off, what do we do now? Um, yeah. So we want to prevent things like that, make sure that we're asking the right questions. Yeah, and, and, and fundamentally, that's on the client to do that because the IT vendor may or may not know, may or may not test, may or may not. I mean, in the best of worlds, uh, all of you that I'm talking to and all of the people that you know and so on and so on are all doing the right thing. But we know better than that. that, that that's not the way the real world works. Uh, and if you look at, I, I'm gonna put up next the NIST framework. Uh, Kenji and I are gonna play a game. Kenji, you pick one of the elements down, one of the, uh, the, the functions identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Pick one of the practices, anyone, and give it to me. All right. Well, let's look at the first one here. We're going to be looking at the uh, asset management. Okay. Asset management. Now, asset management is all the computers and all on the network. Who has the responsibility for managing that? Is it the IT vendor? Is it the company? or is it both of them together? That's now a trick question to you, Kenji. You're the one who picked asset management. Yeah. It's definitely gonna be a shared responsibility. I mean, as, as the okay. remote monitoring uh, management tools are constantly picking and scraping up all the new assets that are hitting the network and the domain, uh -huh. somebody on the business side has to say, yes, we're, we're purchasing these, these pieces of hardware, we're making sure that we're double checking and crossing it with the vendor. Because the vendor is just gonna go say, hey, it's checked in, we're, running our SIM across them to make sure there's no threats going in and out of it. But is it really yours is kind of the question of, you know, where that audit needs to come into it. It is a shared responsibility. With that. That's right. You pick another one and I'll, I'll answer it. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, let's look at the, uh, the incident response planning. Incident response planning. Let's see. Uh, the, I know this is a trick question. So let, give me a moment to think about it. Certainly the IT vendor has a role to play because if there's an incident, good gods, it's going to happen on the computers and so on. But what about the business? Let me think. Way, I know, 
the business also has a responsibility, doesn't it? Because it may have to make a breach disclosure. It may have to decide, you know, to announce to, to staff, hey, we got an incident, you know, like turn off your computers or whatever that is. So that also takes both groups working together. And I will argue, and I think Kenji, you'll agree with me, that uh, even as we just played with this, these are all shared responsibilities, right? And even for those that aren't familiar with the, the NIST or the CMMC framework, I mean, this is a really good reminder too that when it comes down to the more common ones, when it comes down to HIPAA or FINRA, these are still the same controls, policies, and procedures that are part and blended into those uh, compliances as well. Yeah. So it's not just when you're on the upper end of the spectrum, it's, it's any part of the spectrum, you still have your responsibility. That's right. Yeah, if you've got HIPAA information, you got to live with this. If you've got, uh, if you play in the CMMC world, you got to live with this. Uh, and even if you don't have a specific framework that you have to live with, you need a framework to manage security. And this is becoming one of the defaults. So, you know, that, just one is, more example. Go ahead. Yeah, one, yeah. one of my thoughts too was kind of, because right now there's no regulation to say that, you know, if you're a backup provider, you have to do test for stores and validation of, of the data. But until that comes into play, it's almost like as a client, as, as a person that's contracting out and bringing in an outsource group, there, there almost needs to be a point where you're drawing a contract out for them to become your service provider. And you're not so much signing their contract to have them come on and do your support because they're yeah. only going to do what's part of their policies and, and, and regular norm. But when you have this compliance that's overseeing you and governing that you have to be able to control and manage all these groups, you have to make sure that there's some part of this contract that's being written from your end that's kind of like a, a you know, IT practices for dummies kind of booklet that says, you know, we will, <laughs> we will fundamentally do these uh, audits every yeah. so often. And we check these certain policies and update them at a certain point within the year. So, um, right. you know, and it, there's a lot of responsibility that falls back on the clients. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and this next slide begins to lay out, you know, what the responsibilities are between the client and, and the vendor. Uh, I mean, as, as, as we've laid it out, uh, on the client side, the client has to comply with laws, regulations, and agreements, uh, all of which include security of the IT infrastructure. The client also separate from its responsibility uh, has a desire, may not have a legal responsibility to do it, but to protect its own sensitive information. Certainly if it's a publicly traded company, it has that legal responsibility as well. If it's privately owned, uh, it, may it may feel no information security responsibility. Uh, but it really should have them. So it's got those responsibilities. And as part of that, and this is explicit in California law, including in the CCPA, if you're familiar with that, uh, the client's responsible for ensuring that third parties comply with the laws that the client is responsible for. It's got to provide clear, explicit requirements, something that we find doesn't happen often. And then it has to validate third party compliance to them. And all that pushes down to the vendor. And Kenji, what's that look like then from the vendor's perspective? Yeah. So from the vendor's perspective, I mean, you've got this, this responsibility that you have to have constant upkeep on this. And it, it's raising a child. It's, it's practically having another baby at, at the end of the day. You know, just because yeah. you had it doesn't mean you're done. You've got 18 years to keep, you know, feeding, growing, educating it and constantly going with it. Um, so, you know, from the vendor's responsibility, we have to make sure that that you learn on that discovery call, you know, what's your baseline security, uh, your compliances, and how are we going to go through and manage and build that up with you? And yeah. how often the thing, you're doing those audits and assessments constantly on a revolving basis because just because you put encryption on doesn't mean that it's going to hold up six months from now. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. that the user will be following it a week from now. Um, so, you know, definitely on the responsibility of the vendors is a, a whole piece there for you to be responsible for. Yeah. Yeah, well said. So um, once we get responsibilities properly aligned, and of course this one slide is the tip of an iceberg in terms of all the responsibility that has to be allocated. I mean, ultimately the uh, information that the client has to say to the, the vendor, these are the ports that we allow open. You, know, uh, you make sure 
that if you're connecting a server to the internet, it goes through a DMZ. You make sure that you, the client says to the vendor, you make sure you've got change management in place so that when you change our network, you're not going to mess up and cause us downtime. Uh, and if something goes wrong, you're going to be able to gracefully recover. For example, those are, 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 are some of the things that, that need to be done. And, and ultimately, uh, it, it really means apportioning cybersecurity roles between the client and the vendor. Uh, if you look again on the left side of the screen, these are uh, seven things that our firm, Miller Kaplan, over the years has seized as really key strategic imperatives. These are the critical success factors for information security. First, that it be managed. Uh, there be leadership, there's governance, there's a leadership team, and the leadership team is, uh, has subject matter management expertise on it. Second, there be framework driven policies, that there be a mechanism for classifying, controlling access to information, for doing information inventories in the language of the California Consumer Privacy Act. The client's responsible for making sure that there's awareness training and cultures built into the, the client's organization. Clients responsible for managing vendor and third party security. Clients responsible for secure management of the IT infrastructure. That's its responsibility. And the client's responsible ultimately for the incident response and business continuity preparedness of itself. And all of that one by one, and now Kenji, it's your turn, moves over to the vendor's side. And that's, that's constantly doing that, that same revolving door, you know, making sure you're part of that leadership team. So, you know, you'll be sitting in with your clients and understanding every, every so often a baseline of, you know, where things are residing at, what things have been accomplished, tracking it's it's a large project management that never ends so you're always going back and double checking your tasks and what's been completed um you know making sure you're collaborating for the security uh there's other things too that a lot of people don't think about too is like the the risk assessments you know just because your client's not asking for it you should have that mindset to remember like oh yeah they do fall under a compliance we need to be doing risk uh, assessments or pen testing every so often um, so these are things that, you know, they need to be also vendor led as well. And, and part of their, their roles and responsibilities to bring up, mm -hmm. um, you know, collaborating with like the, like you were saying, the instant response and the business continuity, they've got to understand from their side, you know, Hey, like we've got an incident response plan. What's our SLA internally and how's our SLA internally re revolve out to our clients in the actual end. So mm -hmm. who do we contact? Who's the point of contact? Who's the notification parties involved? So if we take 14 days to find out, or not to find out, but we take 14 days to notify our client that there's been a HIPAA breach, they've only got a very limited amount of time after that to then figure out through the audit what was touched, what was accessed, do we need to report it, and who do we report it to? So, you know, you've got to have that role to understand, you know, within their compliance, what's your responsibility as a, an appropriate time to notice and yeah. get information over and who's involved. Yeah, that, that, and that's a good illustration, if you will, of the need for subject matter management expertise on the client side, because ultimately, if, if the client doesn't have itself subject matter expertise, then at best, it's a passive observer to the whole process. Oh, our IT people told us this. Oh, our IT people told us that. I don't know what it means, but that's what they told us. Well, if that's the way it is, how can they manage it effectively? Uh, so the, you know, the, 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 they can approve or disapprove budgets, with, but they don't understand what's going on. I mean, we have talked to uh, IT vendors after doing an assessment where we found all kinds of missing patches, which is very common when we come in and first do an assessment. Uh, typically, the reason for that is one of two things. Either the vendor didn't know the importance of patching, and the client didn't know it, so it just slipped through the cracks. We'll talk about that in a moment. Or the vendor understood the value of patching, but was unable to explain to the client why this money should be spent for patching. Clients are very cost sensitive. Oh, you want to charge an extra X dollars a month a seat, whatever, and to keep my systems patched? No, nah, I don't think I want to do that. Well, that's not because the client doesn't care, that's because the client doesn't know. And that difference is vital here. Uh, so you, you, we really gotta make sure that the client themselves 
have this subject matter ex ex expertise. Uh, and it's, it's not just for security. That, when you've got intelligent people, trained people, smart people on both sides of the table, uh, you find that schedules improve, projects finish faster, they finish at a lower cost, quality's higher. It's like any quality management or maturity model. I mean, if any of you have studied total quality management, it's the same thing. It's that same process. If you've studied any of the maturity models, like you find in CMMC, it's the same thing. As you work your way up the maturity scale, you end up improving cost, quality, and and uh, and schedules. All of them. Uh, I mean, that's that's baked into the Air Force. Any technology, any communication system that touches nuclear missiles, has to go through a very very rigid, independent. Uh, verification and validation that is based on the client, in this case, the Air Force, having subject matter management expertise. Uh, and having been there, done that several years ago, uh, I can speak firsthand how that independent analysis uh, s saved us from putting into operations a cruise missile system with a flaw in it that would have allowed it to have gone off accidentally. So you can imagine just the, in that case, the value of that independent look. Uh, but even just in, in, like I said, in quality with uh, um, the, the way this is analogous to that, uh, back in the 1980s, uh, Motorola was a loser in the quality area against the particularly Japanese companies that were making early generation uh, pagers and cell phones and things like that. Motorola said, no way, their chairman, uh, CEO put quality management as number one on the agenda every week when they met with management. They pushed that down, not just their own stuff, but all the way down to their vendors. And within just a few years, Motorola was a world leader in quality management. It's the same thing here. These are the win 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 opportunities. Yeah. And, and uh, even, yeah, in, in separate industries on that note, too, it's, it's interesting because. You talk about continual, uh, continuous improvement, just like a, a regular ISO standard. You've got to have some kind of understanding in order to improve. Because if you're not documenting, creating the baselines, moving it further, setting your new bar there and moving on, you're yeah. just reinventing the wheel every time. And, and the people that are really changing this in different industries too is like Tesla. Tesla got called out about quality controls and that there's a, a large amount of warranty work and, and issues going on with Teslas. And then even with Zoom, Zoom just had that whole security issue at the beginning of the year, uh, kicking off with COVID. Mm -hmm. They went out, hired the CISO for Facebook, I believe it was. And they're investing in all the people that are the subject matter of expertise to go in there and continuously improve their standards and performance so they can have a, a better performance for their clients in the end. Yeah, no, that, that, that is so vital in, in, in all of this. So um, with that, let's go on to our, our last slide because we all know in business, I mean, the reality is one of management's most important things to do is to keep things from slipping through the crack. It's the devil is in the details. It's things that you, you've thought about, but you just, you haven't gotten it down to actually doing something about it. Or you're doing something about it, but then reality intervenes and you slip up. Or you're, I mean, there can be a thousand excuses. But at the same time, the challenge is to keep those excuses from having to be used, if you will. So, Kenji, you want to take, take the lead on, on this, this slide? Yeah, so a lot of this resonates directly with the IT management that I provide. But when it comes down to the client side subject matter expertise, you know, you need to have somebody on your side that's working for you, that's protecting your budget, protecting your security, and protecting your, your compliances. Because, you know, it just takes one step out of alignment you get a breach, you get the audit, and all of a sudden you have fines that are going to close your business at the end of the day. Um, you know, things about having to document, document, document. I love that you put that in there. Uh, because at the end of the day, an MSP or an IT vendor has a role. And in, you should be looking at it the same way as an employee. So if they're fitting the role, we keep moving and progressing with everything. If they're not fitting the role, we need to set out plans of action for them to correct and, and make sure that, you know, if there's some kind of security issue in their role, that they go ahead and patch and manage it and get it all mitigated. If not, then we need to start looking around at either changing the role, kind of condensing it down or possibly replacing them. 
but then you get in this whole kind of catch 22. Well, I, I didn't know exactly how to manage them. Things went sideways. We didn't like the way that it ended out. And we're going to go and vet somebody else and hire them, but I don't know what I'm looking for. Yeah. So it comes back to that, that SME where you have to have somebody on your side to understand how do you evaluate a vendor? How do you actually classify what roles are going to be fulfilling? Are, how do you know that they're understanding what you're asking of them? So, you know, yeah. when you tell them, I need to have monthly meetings to, to be going over all the cybersecurity and compliance tracking. And they just go, okay, okay, okay. You get to the meeting and you find out they throw in an account manager that's a kid out of high school that has no, no understanding of anything except for, I can put your admin credential in if you want to download that, that uh, application on your, your workstation. So, you know, you've got to be able to vet all this out and move forward with it. Um, and it really comes down to that, that core piece of, you know, someone's got to understand on your side. And yeah. it delivers on time. It delivers under budget when you do this. And it's a little investment that will go a long ways for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is so abs- absolutely true, Kenji. I mean, as you're you're talking, and I'm I'm looking at as well as a a, a chat, a, a comment from Brett uh, on on all of this. The idea that what what Brett writes, I feel another common thing that is forgotten is budgeting money and time on both the vendor and the client side, uh, whether it's risk assessments, pen testing, annual reviews, all of all of those kinds of things. Those are as as you and I are talking, shared responsibilities, and uh, they they come to the the key question. The client's got to be able to ask questions and understand the answers. I mean, we had a situation uh, goes back a year or so ago. A client of ours uh, had contracted with a third party to develop a, a basically a mission critical app for our client. Uh, we weren't in, in, involved in that at, at the time, but uh, that project first was late, over budget. Uh, kind of pushing up against where the client wanted to go live and wasn't really sure that the quality of the product was able to let it go live. The vendor said, oh yeah, we're ready. Everything's okay. And they went live. It didn't work. Um, That's when they called us in and and, and very, very sadly, uh, the whole situation ended up with first they had to go, the client had to go back to the old system they were using. So they didn't get the new system that they'd already spent three times budget. They'd spent half a million dollars by now on this product that was supposed to cost much less than that. Uh, And then uh, comes to discover that in fact, the vendor's capabilities were not up to what the client needed. Uh, Ultimately, it ended up in an arbitration. Nobody won. A vendor loses, the client loses, the lawyers won a little bit of money, but I know enough lawyers, that's not how they like to make their money. They'd they'd much rather make their money protecting and saving money, not in dealing with with these kinds of situations. And sadly, that's, that's what can happen when you lack that, coordination that that collaboration that uh we just heard from shalini uh needing to be a part of all of this i mean that's just a a beautiful word collaboration even and it's when you've got parity on both sides we've got somebody on the client side able to speak knowledgeably about it technology management about security uh management to the to the the uh back to the, the client, to the vendor, if you will. Uh, Kenji, any uh, final thoughts before we wrap it up? Turn it back over to Fellum. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we talked about like unexpected costs and whatnot. I, I think a one thing that uh, on my side that I enforce with a lot of my clients that I, I help out is we try to move into a lot of firm fixed pricing for scopes. And it really does chase out the ones that aren't professional or aren't certified to do a lot of the work. Um, mm-hmm. you'll see that, you know, you start off with a $10,000 project and then you get what's called uh, scope creep, creep or bill creep or bill bloating, whatever you want to call it, yeah. which means that it's delivered two weeks late and $5,000 over budget. So, you know, we start looking and I tell vendors all the time and, and MSPs, cause every once in a while I'll get them asking questions or asking for consulting about how to, how to operate and tell them you need to be very upfront and, and boast about how you have industry partners, how are you using, you know, services like PAX 8 where they have professional services that are part of them because you may not be certified to do the work, but they are a Microsoft powerhouse or you're working with, with Rackspace and you have somebody that's bigger than you and better certified and more uh, entrenched in the actual uh, service itself or products that can make sure they have your back and bail you out if needed. Because when it comes down to it, it's not so much about putting that you are a uh, Dell you know, partner, 
that's cool. You know, you sell HP and Dell products, but we want to know who's going to support it if something happens, who's going to be in the tier three, tier four uh, support desk for that. So, you know, really look at your strengths and your partners and be forward about it too, because that also helps a lot of the decisions that we make to know that you're partnering strategically with the right people. Because at the end of the day, an MSP is, is pretty much Batman and you have your tool belt. Without the tool belt, what do you really have? You're only about half the solutions. So, you know, think about who you partner and bring in with you to have your hand as things go forward. Yeah. Yeah, well said. And if I have time for just a final story on scope creep and just the importance of that um, and the reason to tell the story. So uh, in, the, in the 1980s, I was doing a lot of work in, in uh, the emerging uh, software engineering, security engineering was being developed. I was working for NASA, uh, the Defense Department, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera the White House. Um, and the GAO in 1979 published a paper that I became aware of um, that basically said somewhere like 80% of all software, of all computer projects failed. Why did they fail? GAO did this study. The fundamental reason for failure, and I say this because it's 40 years later, and it's still a fundamental failure reason, is scope creep not properly managing scope. And that's just one of the many things that the vendor and the client have to manage collaboratively. Neither side's right, wrong, good, bad. It's like, hey, we got to manage scope. This is what we're going to do now. This is what we're going to do in the next phase. This is what we're going to do in the phase after that, and so on. So you get a regular, rigorous kind of, go back to the word collaboration. Um, with that, again, I want to thank you, Fellum, uh, and um, I'm, I'm going to stop the screen share. Kenji, any final words? Uh, no, I, I'm good. Thank you for the uh, the time and, and, and joint effort on this stand, and, and Fellum, I mean, pleasure to be here. And I'm excited to see how this, this whole market moves forward, and we're starting to see a little bit how like you can look up Louisiana and report a shift and we got to make sure that both sides of this, these parties start to meet up in the middle somewhere. Absolutely. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. That's, uh, that, that, that's a really big tour de force. Uh, you put a lot of effort into that presentation and I, and I like the double out. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I really think that it's, uh, it's important to think, well, what sort of standards should we expect from the MSP of tomorrow? Um, what sort of security things should we hold them accountable to? Um, uh, we've got some nice comments in, in the audience. You've, uh, you, you've already uh, seen uh, Brett's uh, comment. Uh, Rachel says managing scope is important in recruitment and hiring too. Um, mm -hmm. I think Rachel uh, knows a lot about that because uh, she's part of rec recruitment um, security. Uh, yeah. I, 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 like, I like where we've taken this and I like that the pandemic has given us the opportunity to... Uh, bring you down to San Diego from Los Angeles, but virtually, um, mm -hmm. which, which, which I think will be good. You, 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 you'll come next year physically. Uh, it's not too far for you guys. No, it's a or, few or, hours, depending on traffic. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, um, we've got mm -hmm. another comment in the audience. Leanne says, great information. Thank you. Um, Stan, uh, Kenji, and uh, Secure the Village and Oversight IT. Uh, thank you very much for a really interactive session. Uh, this, is, this has been great. Um, uh, please give everyone a round of applause. Um, we found the applause button now, so uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see you in the audience, and um, great. I, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Great. Mark says, thanks. Uh, Zishan says, uh, just trying to prepare for the 210 session. Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, Zishan. We will uh, bring you from a delegate to uh, panelist, no problem. I will do that by the magic of Zoom. Uh, it's a good uh, time to thank uh, Noble 4, Hack DefNet, uh, Southern Utah University, uh, Intelligence Research Institute, Secure Smart Office, and Recruitment Security for supporting this event. Uh, we've already heard from our fantastic media partners, Secure the Village and Oversight IT. Um, please keep MSS San Diego going. Uh, it's a great hashtag. We're doing pictures on LinkedIn, a few things on Twitter. Um, 
but yeah you can be the one to increase that uh, so 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 that's really good news uh, a few shout outs in the audience uh, we we still have dr Kesar there which is really good uh, we've got a, a panelist from later on uh, hello aaron still there cedric um yeah cedric um uh, tracy can't uh, come but uh, it's good to have you there cedric uh casey's still there ivan harry hi harry yeah, that's great uh, Marat, Mike, Paul, Paul, there's quite a lot of Pauls, that's good. Uh, Rusty, of course, later, Sam, Stefan, Zishan, uh, Mark, yes, Mark is still there, fantastic, thanks for, your, your very active participant, Mark, uh, keep it going. Um, I know it's a, it's, it's a big program, so, so, it's, so it's great to, uh, to have everything uh, still pumping. So, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome our moderator for the next panel, uh, which is Sam Sailors uh, from Secure Smart uh, Office. Um, <clears throat> I'll just uh, bring uh, Sam up uh, whilst I bring our wonderful panelists. Uh, we, uh, yes, nice to see you, Sam. How are you doing? 